Uh, welcome. Uh, this is the creation care team breakout session uh, of the Laudato Si and the US conference. I'm Paz Artasa Regan, creation care team's program manager mm -hmm. at Catholic Climate Covenant. The session does have live interpretation. If you need Spanish interpreting, please click on the Spanish icon in the interpretation box and you will be able to hear the presentation in Spanish. The session is being recorded and we'll, all will receive a link to the recording. If you have questions, please write them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. The chat box can be used for dialogue between participants and the panelists. But if, if you want a question answered, please do it in the Q&A box. If you know who in the panel the question needs to be addressed to, please write their name with the question. At this point, we will go to Father Emmett Farrell, Director of Creation Care Ministry for the Diocese of San Diego, who will get us started with a prayer. Hello, everyone. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A future not our own. It helps now and then to step back and take a long view. The kingdom is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we can do is complete, which is a way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. No statement says all that could be said. No prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. This is what we are about. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces far beyond our capacities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something, and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and to do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between a master builder and a worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Father Emmett. We've added a uh, land acknowledgement to most of our uh, sessions. So if you would um, please uh, listen to this one uh, today. We recognize the deep and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and the ancestral and treaty lands. We acknowledge that our conference is sponsoring organizations, Catholic Climate Covenant and Creighton University are on Nakachtak and Piscataway lands and Omaha lands, respectively. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the indigenous communities whose lands and water we benefit from today. Please take a moment to acknowledge the traditional caretakers of the land where you live and commit to learning more about your indigenous communities uh, that you live around and partnering with them in their struggles to take care of creation. We will pause for a moment so you can do that. If you'd like, you can add your acknowledgement in the chat box. 
If you're not sure whose lands you might reside on, you can look it up using the native land tool that I have the um, link there. We're going to get started with the real part of the meat of this presentation. I'm vegetarian, perhaps I shouldn't use the word meat. Uh, the, there are over 450 creation care teams, uh, about a quarter of them are public teams on the CCT map uh, that are on our website. We resource them with a monthly CCT email, uh, resource library, uh, that contains variety of tools and ideas for that month, a dedicated Facebook group, and one-on-one -on -one support. This uh, session, you're going to learn more about the CCT program and about the amazing depth and breadth of creation care teamwork throughout the United States. The presentation is truly a gift from the members of this working group to the entire US Catholic Church. Each of them is working tirelessly, either in their parish, their diocese, their faith community, to motivate Catholics on creation care and Laudato Si. They are the true experts and they will share their ideas and insights with you today. I'd like to express my deep and immense gratitude to every single one of you that are in this working group. You can see everybody's names on this slide. Uh, I also need to express my thankfulness to the track leaders, Dr. Phil Sakimoto, a member and past leader of creation care team at St. Pius X Catholic Church in Granger, Indiana, and director of the and minor in sustainability at the University of Notre Dame. Kayla Jacobs, director of programs, Laudato Si Ministries, Diocese of Joliet, and Dr. Catherine Wright, Associate Professor, Wingate University, and also part of the Care for Creation Ministry Team lead, she's the lead, at St. Matthew Parish in North Carolina. I am in complete awe of the entire working group's perseverance, genius, and collaborative skills. You will be hearing from many of them throughout the presentation. All the members have shared their gifts to ensure that we have an incredibly informative, rich presentation for you today. They answered this call to work beyond their regular jobs and ministries, and in my opinion, have managed to produce incredible resources that will assist new creation care teams, as well as established creation uh, care teams. If you're not familiar with the Covenant CCT program, it's designed to assist parishes, schools, and religious communities confront climate change and creation care as a group. Creation care teams work together, and they try to do it for three main things. Sustainability in their parishes and religious community facilities, integrating aspects of creation care into their uh, ministry lives, and advocating for faith-informed uh, climate and creation care policies. I hope that after this presentation, no matter where you are in the creation care journey, you will find ideas, resources to begin or to strengthen your creation care ministry. If you're already in an established CCT, you will be re-energized and ready to continue your holy work with ideas to overcome challenges and obstacles. And with examples of uh, successful CCTs, uh, you will, I hope that you consider start a team in your parish or faith community or your school. I hope you leave with tools and resources. As always, I'm available to assist anyone wishing to start a CCT or anyone encountering challenges. Now we move into our talented working groups presentation. We move into the presentation that Dr. Phil Sakimoto has for us. So good afternoon or good morning, depending on where in the world you are. It falls to me to open our session by taking a page from my past background as an astrophysicist and the former head of NASA's public education program in space science. 
I'd like to offer some motivation for you by reminding you of the tremendous gift that God has given us, a gift that began 13.8 billion years ago with the Big Bang, an event that the Vatican has called a mighty and beautiful act of energy, love, and light. This is the light, light from the Big Bang at a time when all there was in the universe was energy in the form of light, with some of it coalescing into atomic particles. As the universe expanded and cooled, structures like stars and galaxies began to appear. Trillions of galaxies, among which our attention is drawn to one very special galaxy, the Milky Way, within which lies one special star, our sun. The sun provides energy, light, to our planet Earth, which makes it possible for life to thrive here. But life on Earth was not always as it is now. The early Earth had an atmosphere that was mostly carbon dioxide, which was wonderful for early plant life, such as the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, which you can still see today in these pancake-shaped structures called stromatolites that we find in Western Australia. The algae and the higher order plants that followed removed most of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and replaced it with oxygen. They created the oxygen that allowed animals and eventually you and me to come into being. But where did the carbon go? It was incorporated into the structures of the plants and eventually buried underground where some of it became sequestered in the form of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Now, if all of creation is a gift to us, then we have the moral responsibility to, responsibility to treat that gift wisely, to nurture and protect it. But unfortunately, we are not doing so. Instead, we are digging up those fossil fuels and burning them. And burning means that we're reattaching oxygen to the carbon, releasing energy, which we use, and producing carbon dioxide. We are quite literally recreating that original carbon dioxide, putting it up in the air, with the net result, as you well know, that we are causing the earth to get warmer with severe consequences for our everyday lives. We are, in a very real sense, undoing the billions of years of the gift of creation that God has given us. In response, in 2015, Pope Francis issued the encyclical, you know well, Laudato Si, Care for Our Common Home. In it, he says forthrightly that there is a solid scientific consensus as to the reality of climate change and to the fact that we human beings are the ones who are causing it. The science and related social issues reported in Laudato Si are very, very accurate. They are based on findings of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, bodies comprised of the very best researchers in their respective fields. Pope Francis called them together. He wanted to hear from them exactly what we know about the state of our planet. They told him. He wrote it down. And this formed the basis upon which Pope Francis made his urgent appeal to every person on earth to engage in a new dialogue on the future of our planet. That's what we're doing right now. We will talk in this session about how we, as members of creation care teams, can work towards changing the lifestyles in our homes, our parishes, our dioceses, in order to help mitigate the ravages of climate change and indeed to care not only for the gift of creation in our world, but also to care for every single person on this planet. But before we get there, let me underscore the urgent need for rapid and substantial actions by briefly reviewing how in the scant six years since Laudato Si was written, this climate crisis has become sadly much, much worse. The Arctic, 
it's warming two or three times faster than the rest of the planet because of a phenomenon we call Arctic amplification. In short, in places where there was once ice, such as this wonderful scene of the John Muir Glacier in Alaska in 1880, that white ice reflected a lot of sunlight back into space. But now at the very same location, the ice is gone, melted away. The exposed bare ground and water absorbs more heat from the sun than the ice did. And thus the ground and water get warmer, which encourages more ice to melt, which leads to more absorption of heat and so forth. The rate of warming is amplified. As one consequence of this, in the rapidly warming Arctic tundra in Siberia, we have recently found huge craters that have been blown open by bubbles of methane being released from underground. Methane traps 30 times more heat than does carbon dioxide. So with thousands of these methane craters showing up all over Siberia, the warming is accelerating even more, which releases more methane, which drives the warming ever faster, and so it goes. Just last week, a new report came out showing that oceanic dead zones, areas near the coastlines where oxygen is depleted because of the warming coupled with fertilizer runoff, these areas are emitting nitrous oxides. And nitrous oxides have not 30 times, but 300 times the heat trapping capacity of carbon dioxide which leads to even more rapid warming, which releases more nitrous oxide. You know how this goes by now. Findings such as these and many others are too new to be included in the climate models and the government science reports that you're used to hearing about. The fact of the matter is that the rate of warming is now increasing much faster than even you, who I know are well tuned into this stuff, much faster than even you think it is. Climate-driven extreme weather disasters are now occurring so frequently that if you're paying attention, you will see them in the news almost every day. The imbalance of warming, the fact that, um, that the poles are now warming faster than the rest of the planet means that the temperature difference, pole to equator is lessening, which weakens the jet stream cause it to get kinky like this, which allows cold air to come down far south, warm air to move far north at different places and different times. And you've seen this happen. You saw it last February with the incredible cold experienced all the way in Southern Texas. And you're seeing it right now with the ridiculous heat waves. This is a map released two days ago by climate scientist, Jim Hansen, Jim Hansen one of my former colleagues at NASA. And it shows that in the month of June, we had temperature anomalies that is temperatures 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal throughout the Western part of North America, Europe, Asia. And in many cases, we were seeing high temperatures that are all time record highs for their locality. A study released three days ago estimates that now we are experiencing some 5 million deaths every year due just to extreme heat or extreme cold. 5 million deaths every year. That's a million more each year than the total number of deaths from COVID. Our most recent hurricane, last week's Elsa, fortunately was only a category one, but as the hurricane season progresses and it's starting earlier than normal this year, the sea surface will get hotter and we are sure to see an ever increasing number of category four or five superstorms. But Elsa did cause a lot of flooding as we expected because the air is warmer, warm air holds more moisture than does cooler air, and so when it rains, there's more water to dump. That's happened along our eastern seaboard. And it's happening in a report I saw this morning from the AP 
about incredible flooding throughout Europe, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, flooding that in some places is two months of rain falling in just two days. Catastrophic flooding like this is going to become more and more and more commonplace. Other areas are experiencing droughts. With the great heat in the West, we're having all time record drought in the Western US. And in our, the areas of our Southern neighbors and the so-called dry corridor in Central America, year after year of drought, it's causing people to be forced to leave their homes because they can only grow food there. And so they're trying to make their way North, causing this so-called crisis on our Southern border. By 2050, estimates say we could have as many as 200 million climate refugees, people seeking new places to live because climate change has made living in their original homes no longer possible. 200 million people, that's 25 New York cities. That's two thirds the population of the US. Most of them very poor, many of them children who need to be resettled leading to the most critical global human dignity problem perhaps we've ever seen. Globally, these extreme weather catastrophes racked up here year by year from 1980 to the present 2020 with storms in this yellow orange, floods, mudslides in blue, extreme temperatures, droughts, fires in red. You see we're getting up to nearly a thousand extreme weather catastrophes every year. And with each coming year, it's only going to get worse. So immediate aggressive actions are needed now, not 10, 20, 30 years in the future, now. But you know what? We can stop climate change in its tracks. We have in hand all the technologies we need. What we don't have is the societal will to employ them on large scales. So that is why this Laudato Sea Action Platform is so important. As you heard last night, the Vatican is asking every Catholic organization on earth to make a seven-year commitment to responding to the call of Laudato Sea. Out of the seven types of organizations targeted, we're focusing in this section on parishes and dioceses, and specifically on what creation care teams can do to meet the seven goal areas of Laudato Si. And we have a particular focus on the response to the cry of the earth, because if we don't respond to the cry of the earth, if we don't stop climate change, we can't respond effectively to the cry of the poor. And these other goals, economics, lifestyles, education, spirituality, that's the basis of how we change the way we live that lets us address the climate crisis. The role of the Catholic Church is profound. The Catholic Church is arguably the largest international organization in the world. If we can move Catholics in every corner of the globe to become active and vocal about climate change, we could quite literally change the future of our planet. We, concerned Catholics, have the power to do that. So let's get started. After a brief interlude to hear from some of our youths, we will offer you a roadmap for planning and carrying out your creation care team's response to this Laudato Si action platform. So, Catherine, take it away. Absolutely, thank you so much, Phil, for showing us the deep why of the work that we're doing. So my name is Catherine Wright, and I'm an eco-theologian that works in, um, we work in North Carolina, and I will be your moderator for the remainder of your session. If you hear some background noise, um, I'm right in the fight, flight path in uh, San Diego, so if they grace our background, I will try and slow down and stop when they're the loudest and continue with my work after that. So reflecting on why is really important. But then we have to get to the how and the what of creation care. Because creation care is work. And for some, it is very hard work. 
Some days it feels like you are shouting into a storm, but hopefully this conference will help you remember that you're not alone and it is important not to give up. So thanks to the very creative work of Roger, one of our team members, I would like to offer you all a message of hope and inspiration from our young Catholics. For me, it was a message my heart really needed to hear. And there are a lot of reasons that I'm passionate about climate change, but I think one of the biggest ones for me is thinking about the future and what's still going to be here for those who come after us. And in my lifetime, as I've grown up, I feel like everyone started to realize that the effects of climate change are things that we're feeling now. It's not something that we're going to have to deal with in the future. We're feeling the consequences right here and right now. Uh, so I live in Houston and people have started calling Houston the city of storms. The effects are exacerbated by climate change all the time, and that's just become something that's normal for us and we've learned to live with. And I think something that's really important to me is knowing that there's still going to be a world here for my children to experience once I'm gone. I want to know that there's going to be a world that those who come after us will still have the opportunity to experience. That inspires me to care for creation and to constantly look for things that we can change and policies that we can challenge. Fiercely passionate about climate change and environmental action and environmental justice and constantly challenges me to look beyond the surface and look at structures and systems and policies and how ordinary citizens can do extraordinary things. And doing social justice work to look at the incremental changes that happen. Thank you. My name is Claire and climate change is definitely very anxiety provoking for me. Seeing the impacts of climate change in my day to day life through heat, through um, fires in the region I live in is incredibly frightening. Knowing those impacts are happening around the world is overwhelming. Um, I think what helps me combat that anxiety and stay active and present is reminding myself that I am not alone and that there are many other young people and Catholics who are active in this work and have the same fears and concerns that I do. And also taking time to just be present in nature, um, to be alone in silence without my phone, to just be in awe and take in the expansiveness of creation helps me to stay grounded as well. And the thought of climate change is very scary and overbearing at times, but I do believe that every single voice and every single person can create an influence. But on, over time, when people see how passionate you are about something, those habits sneak into their lives. And it can be a scary process and it can be overwhelming the more you learn about climate change. But if I've learned anything, one person can, the cliche, definitely have a ripple effect. And so even when it's overbearing, you can still do something. And I think climate change is a critical issue because it affects all of us, but it most directly impacts the most vulnerable, the people that don't have the resources or the people that don't have the health to be able to withstand uh, things like natural disasters, hurricanes, wildfires. And after reading the book Laudato Si, the encyclical by uh, Pope Francis, I really was able to understand better on a human level how much climate change impacts us as people. And um, I would love for local parish churches to just explain what the church teaches on climate change and then to provide us with some actions that we can take on a local, on a personal, and also on a national level. Throughout my high school career, I have worked alongside peers and family members to combat climate change in my local communities. However, a global church must respond to global issues such as climate change with global solutions. 
we must present a united front against the increasingly pressing issue of climate change. Taking on this issue of climate change, it's impacting our brothers and sisters around the world drastically already, and it's very much starting to impact us as well as I just lived through the heat dome in Seattle in the Northwest and continuing to go forward. So uh, my message to church leaders is we need to take urgent action now. This can no longer be a politicized issue. This is an issue that needs to, that speaks to the core of our faith. I grew up between Texas and Mexico City where I experienced stark differences in air and water quality. I realized early on that pollution has a human cost. Climate change is human cost on a global scale. As Pope John Paul II said, no one can claim, as Cain did, that he is not responsible for his brother. As Catholics, we are called by God to be keepers of our brothers and therefore keepers of creation. Through climate advocacy, we grow in charity. As the church, we can profess our faith by mobilizing against climate change. What I want church leadership to know in the U.S. is that I'm Catholic today because I discovered the church's long history of creation spirituality. It did so many things for me as a ad young adult. It unlocked for me my own creative potential. It made me see how beautiful the world is, how God is active everywhere. And it made me realize that I have the power and the responsibility to do something about climate change, that it is within our control to help bring about the kingdom of God. Climate change is one of the biggest issues facing our church and our world today. Um, and when I think about climate change, I get a little overwhelmed, frankly, um, and I'm not sure what to do. And so when I heard that there are care of creation teams uh, leading us, that that's, gives me joy. Um, and I'm ready to be your hands and be try to be the hands of God um, to try to help God's creation. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing. To those who are doing the work of creation care and you're feeling discouraged, maybe even rejected, um, something that someone told me once is that uh, you have to go out and you have to go find your people. Um, every time you encounter someone who gets fired up about this work, um, it's new energy, it's uh, new relationships to keep you going. Um, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, they're missed. And so it's a whole new encounter with God. And so go out there, find your people. We're waiting for you. So Pope Francis is clear. The holy work of caring for creation requires all of us. Everyone's talents and involvement are needed to address the damage caused by human abuse of creation and those most vulnerable. However, when our session, our team leads got together to try and plan for this day, we wanted to know what the challenges actually were for those in the field, in the parishes, in the diocese. So we surveyed some Creation Care team members to gather this data. And we thank all of you that have taken the survey. You'll notice that some of your wonderful resources and ideas are already moved into the living document that is the roadmap. And your candor in your answers allowed us to get to know you a little bit better and the struggles you face doing this holy work. And if you haven't taken the survey yet, we're not closing the survey. You can use the QR code at the bottom of the screen. If you've never used a QR code before, take your phone, open the camera, point it at the QR code, and then magically your phone will do the rest and pull up a link that'll go directly to the survey. Or after this presentation, you're going to be getting these, these slides in a PDF format that will keep all the links live. So notice that when I hover over a link, the little hand, there's a little hand, that means it's live. And so when you get it, you can take the survey at any time, whenever it's convenient for you. Now we begin here to hear what Phil said about the, the important urgent why, but then with us to move to the what and the how, we start with the challenges, not the stay in the frustration or the grief of what cannot be done, but to use it 
as a springboard for what can be done when we work together. We wanted creation care teams to know that we understand what is blocking their efforts. And we have come together to try and offer ideas to overcome them. We have pooled our resources to share them with you. We also thought it was very important to hear the voices and hear and share the stories of successful creation care teams, those that are thriving and doing some amazing things. We want you to leave this session inspired to do the work of creation care. So take what you need and leave what you don't. And after the session, you will get all of these. So sit back and enjoy some of the connections that we're going to be making here. Uh, Catherine, this is pause. We're getting a lot of folks saying that a lot of the, uh, that it's distorted, that for some reason they can't see the words. Okay, I'm, uh, it's clear for me. So does anyone have any ideas? It, it's heavily pixelated, but. I'm wondering if you unshare and reshare it, you might do oh, it better. I love doing, I can do that. Hello everyone. Is this better? Yes. A little, oh, yeah. Yes, better. The what other I thing we can try to do is the other yeah. panelists could turn off their video temporarily. Uh, I should warn you uh, that I did that and I am not able to go back because Kathy is host at the moment uh -huh. and somehow she has not allowed for uh, that. And I don't want Kathy, not Kathy Wright, Kathy Kwasneski, uh -huh. and I don't want Kathy doing anything. So don't turn your videos off. I already did that. <laughs> uh -huh. This is the joy of living in a virtual world. So what I did <laughs> Phil was I de-optimized the video that uh, did it. button, and I believe when you optimize for video, so I apologize in advance if some of the videos are a little pixelated, but but we'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, so, but right now I have the great pleasure of inviting Roger to begin, and then Rose to talk about the the challenge, the challenge that almost every creation care team spoke about, as well as our collective request or ask of Catholic leaders across the country. Thanks, Catherine. Um, my name is Roger Ingersoll. I'm a retired engineer in the Woodlands, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. So. Um, and my, my screen, by the way, is very clear. So I, I, it, it worked what you did. Um, I think we're all here today because we heard Pope Francis's message inviting us to address climate change in the spirit of Laudato Si. So this holy work is gaining momentum. And this is an opportunity to serve God, earth, and the vulnerable. And it's an invitation for dialogue and action. And most of us understand that nothing worthwhile comes easy. Well, I think every, all of us understand that nothing worthwhile comes easy. So there are investments of time, talent, funding that can make a difference with many examples described in the following slides. So our hope is for universal implementation of Laudato Si across the US. And I think you'll recall that the announcement for this conference stated that the US Catholic Church response to Laudato Si has not been commensurate with the urgency and gravity of the, of the crisis. And, but having all of you here today provides great hope that we can elevate the moral imperative to make progress in our parishes and dioceses. So the key mis message is in the white box. It's uh, very clear that parish and diocesan resources are stretched thin, but even so, church leaders can still provide critically important support for creation care teams across the US in terms of public moral support. So laity and the care for creation teams can help lead the way, but we can't do it in isolation. So as it says in the box, we are asking bishops and diocesan leaders for public moral support to use their voice, talent and power so that more Catholic laity can do the holy work to care for our common home. And to top it off, we have canon law to support us, uh, which is the paragraph at the bottom. I'm not gonna read the entire paragraph from canon 212 paragraph three, but paraphrasing, the Christian faithful are free to make known to their pastors of the church, their needs, especially spiritual ones and their desires. They have the right and at times even the duty 
to manifest to the sacred pastors their opinion on matters which pertain to the good of the church and to make their opinion known to the rest of the Christian faithful with reverence towards their pastors and attentive to the dignity of persons. So the church is calling on us, the laity, but we still need strong support from church leadership. So now I'm gonna pass on the, the slide, pass the baton on to team member Rose Snyder. Thanks, Roger. Hello, everyone. I'm Rose Schneider, based in Washington, DC. As Roger said, it won't be easy. But this slide discusses five major challenges the diocese and parishes faced and what our Care for Creation teams can do to support them. You'll see up on the right of the circle the limited financial resources. This is a tough time in the US. And diocese and parishes may worry that creation care activities will drain funds from their other activities and projects. So we have to work with them. And to address this realistic concern, successful creation care teams can share their experiences and suggest approaches that have already proven successful to save parishes money on electricity, water, recycling, and others. You can see the second challenge to the right there, low youth involvement. The church leadership is concerned, concerned about the ongoing loss of youth in the church in the US. But some of our teams have seen great value working with these youth who are excited about care for creation. For example, in the earlier video, you saw young Catholics passionately discussing Hello their concerns about climate change. Diocese, parishes, and Care for Creation teams need to more effectively engage youth, support their leadership, and amplify their voices. The third one at the bottom is overburdened staff. Ever gone into an office and see people running around trying to do all that they can possibly do? They've got many responsibilities. So our roadmap that will be presented later will provide a number of resources that can help staff learn about care for creation and, uh, and uh, work on projects. And we will also share success stories from parishes. Okay. And the fourth challenge is inadequate communications. And I've had a lot of experience with this. Diocese and parishes often need help to develop their homilies, bulletins, websites, and other communications to have a care for creation content. So our teams can help by connecting the priests with the wealth of resources at Catholic Climate Covenant and other resources. The Covenant can also share and offer IT and communications help to staff so that they can increase their content in bulletins and websites. That's a tall order, but it is possible. The final challenge you see in, around the circle is that clergy are overwhelmed with their current programs and activities. So the teams need to listen and see that as a reality and help by integrating creation care into already existing activities, such as using green supplies in their already existing dinner programs or, or parish events, offering creation care prayers in their existing prayer groups, not starting a new one, and discussing green options when the, the parish is discussing renovations. So we have this slide and we have this graphic. And in summary, there are challenges for parishes and dioceses as they look to address creation care. But there's a lot of expertise and experience and helpful resources available. And, our, and we can help partner and support parishes and dioceses, exchange ideas and initiatives with these teams that have been successful to expand creation care across the U.S. Catholic Church. So Catherine will now discuss 
in more detail and offer concrete and, and creative ways to help move creation care forward, both at parishes and in dioceses. Catherine? Thank you. Thank you, Rose and Roger. And you're absolutely right. There are lots of things we can do. So now we're going to move into some of the specifics. And I just want to let the panelists know and the team know that when I went on to the survey this morning, almost 60% of the people who responded are not part of a creation care team, but they're individuals who are looking to do this. So we're very excited to offer you so many resources and ideas today. So as Paz started our entire session, she talked about that creation care teams are very important because they are the leaven, the rising agents in our parishes and dioceses and other religious organizations. And Roger and, and Rose, you spoke about that as well. And we want to dissect and look at how is this possible? Well, one of the ways that creation care teams vivify or animate that's for you, Julian. Our parishes and dioceses is by building strong personal relationships with the Catholic leadership within these communities. Another way they leaven, they are leaven, is by mobilizing everyone to do creation care work. And I love what Rose said. You can go to them. They don't always have to come to your creation care team. And it's that reciprocity that mobilizes more people. Creation care team also vivifies parishes when they network with other creation care teams. Cross-pollinate across your state and across the nation. And these partnerships among ally parishes will make sure this work will continue and move at the rate it needs to move. So take a look at the roadmap that was sent out. See if there's any allies in your local area. And finally, creation care teams animate are the heartbeat of parishes when they offer moments and opportunities for ecological conversion for bishops, clergy, ministries, the whole entire parish and the laity. So changing hearts and creating deeper ecological spirituality is crucial to do the work that Phil mentioned that we need to do and need to do now. So we did offer you a roadmap that came out with the email inviting you to this session. Again, if you didn't get that, there's a QR code on the left. Um, but this also, we were very intentional by offering two paths and both paths have merit. We also thank you for the feedback that you've given us in the survey about this. There are many roles for you to play and hopefully you find a home and a space somewhere along these paths. You might be just starting out. So on the bottom left-hand side, there are lots of resources offered for beginning the journey. Now you might be doing creation care for a while now, and hopefully at the top part of this upper path, we've offered you more resources to, to kickstart if you're feeling the blahs or offer more leadership opportunities for your creation care team members. Now we heard from some of your surveys that this work is not moving fast enough, but the upper part path can lead us to this end. But we hope Catholic leaders will leverage every ounce of their power to move it forward. This is the path we do hope for you, support from the parish and the diocese. But we're also very realistic that many creation care teams and individuals wanting to do this work have little to no support, and that's this lower path. So no support from your pastor or your parish or at the diocese level. Some of you named attracting and engaging and retaining members as a huge barrier to your work. Others of you named rejection. And this is where we, right here. Because some people are offended by the church becoming involved in social issues. We are here to tell you, and hopefully the video reinforced this, that this does not need to be the end. Be not afraid. We hope this lower path offers you ideas and ways, allies and resources to continue this whole work. And remember, there's no perfect path. We are all sojourners. We're called to different paths. But if your path is leading to creation care, it is good and it is sorely needed. Now, the next few slides will actually be the footprints and the steps 
that you might take along these paths. So one challenge that many creation care teams spoke about and Roger also spoke about was how to get the diocese and diocesan leaders on board. So on this slide, this is our brainstorming our team did. Notice some are very simple, like surveying your parish, create a report, talk to your bishops about it. Some of it is sharing resources, wonderful resources that you have at your fingertips right down below. So all of these are live links for you. Anything that we resource on the sticky notes are either live links or they're linked at the bottom. Some of them, and Paz, you talk to us a lot about this, is make time to meet with the diocesan staff. Be prepared for these conversations and even bring some donuts. However, we would love to showcase some really interesting ways that people are fostering these partnerships. So let's listen to what's happening in the Chicago diocese. Hello, I'm Andy Pinelli with the St. Elizabeth Seton Creation Care Team in Orland Hills, Illinois. We shouldn't overlook diocese resources in our advocacy efforts for creation care. In Chicago, a group of creation care team representatives and dedicated advocates meets periodically with the Director of Human Dignity and Solidarity so that we can discuss possible support. For the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si, we asked if we could get Cardinal Supich to write a letter or an op-ed in support of the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This is a powerful piece of carbon pricing legislation that has received a welcoming statement from the USCCB. The director seemed reticent, but we challenged him. What does it hurt to ask? And he did, and lo and behold, the Cardinal issued this letter that went out with the monthly newsletter asking the faithful to contact their congressional representatives to support this legislation. It was a powerful lesson that if you don't ask, you won't get. Thank you very much. And now I invite Patrick, tell us your unique story of engagement. Hi, I'm the Director of Social Outreach and Advocacy at St. James Cathedral here in Seattle. And since 2015, St. James Cathedral has been working with a number of parishes, universities, and institutions. Together, we've led environmental summits, hosted season of creation liturgies, offered educational workshops, and created opportunities for parishes to network with one another. But in all of this, we've lacked one thing, and that's the true backing of our archbishop. But then two years ago, we welcomed a new archbishop, Paul Achen. He arrived with a reputation as an environmentalist. So for last, last year's season of creation, St. James invited Archbishop Achen to share his reflections and hopes on Laudato Si. That, uh, inspired our parish partnership to more ardently live out the vision of Laudato Si. And so we rebranded ourselves as the Creation Care Network. And today there's over 25 parishes, institutions, and universities who are working together. This past Lent, we were discerning how we wanted to be in relationship with Archbishop Achen. And so on Earth Day this year, a letter was hand delivered to the Archbishop's office, signed by almost 400 Catholics, including many Catholic school students. We shared our hope of how we wanted to be in relationship with the Archbishop and the Archdiocese, and we shared some of our concrete requests. They include establishing an office of integral ecology, providing assistance to parishes to address climate change, encouraging all parishes and schools to undertake energy audits and upgrades, include Laudato Si in clergy formation, honor the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, 
and then to review all archdiocesan investments divest from fossil fuel companies and redirect those investments towards zero carbon climate solutions. A few weeks later, Archbishop Aitchin wrote back and he thanked us for, his for our letter. He had some ideas percolating and hoped to make some strides. And he concluded by saying that, I truly value the partnership that you and your colleagues have offered me in this regard. As a grassroots effort, the Creation Care Network believes that we need to do the work and not wait for our leaders to lead us. But of course, we would certainly welcome the opportunity to work closely with them. The Archbishop's letter to us affirmed that we were moving in the right direction. Just last month, there was another reorganization in our chancery offices, and that resulted in a deacon who works in the chancery reaching out to me, saying that the Archbishop told him specifically to work with the Creation Care Network. Two nights ago, we held our monthly meeting and we hope to welcome the new deacon to our group, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us. He then indicated that he couldn't take on any leadership role or assignments, which is disappointing. So it's really up to us, the Creation Care Network. It's a blessing for our parishes and institutions and universities to do this together. And we still look forward and hope to be in closer collaboration with our Archbishop and the Archdiocese of Seattle. Wonderful, thank you, Patrick. And I know a lot of you are, are probably writing down all the different wonderful ideas that, that you're hearing and I invite you to, but also notice this last sticky note down here. There are dioceses with action plans. Um, I know San Diego's is hot off the press and they're all live linked here. So if you missed anything that Patrick said, um, or you'd like more of a, a, a look of an over, kind of overarching plan, we have that at your fingertips. But now, Kayla, can you tell us a little bit about what is happening with the Diocese of Juliet? Hi, everybody. I'm the Director of Programs for La Dato Si Ministries for the Diocese of Joliet. So it's a diocesan level ministry. In a few years, we partnered with the Archdiocese of Chicago, as well as our local interfaith power and light, which is called Faith in Place. So Faith in Place was coordinating bus trips down to our capital for an environmental lobby day. And so we, along with the Archdiocese, really wanted a strong Catholic presence at this lobby day. So we partnered together to get as many of our parishioners on those buses. Um, and during that lobby day, I was able to make great connections with some of our parishioners, but also parishioners from the Archdiocese that just fostered a continuous, uh, nice relationship of working together. Um, and for me, the best part that came out of that whole experience was it really ignited like a fire in some of our leaders who then came back and joined our diocesan level Ladato Si committee. Um, and it's a great time for them to meet once a month inter parish and coordinate as uh, parish care for creation teams as well. Wonderful. And I know there was a few members who were on those buses and they speak very highly of the experience. So thank you for offering that. So hopefully you have many ideas about how to engage from the grassroots with our bishops and dioceses. But there was another challenge put forward by our creation care teams partnering with pastors and parish leadership teams. You can see that our session team had many, many ideas to do this work, and hopefully some will be helpful for your group. You can see that many involve great communication with parishioners. So notice there are buy some advertising on the back of the bulletin. Perhaps you can connect with articles and, and blogs that can offer many ideas to move creation care forward leaving materials in the vestibule with uh, Father Bob. He mentioned that uh, because the church is your home and this is information that you would love to have your, your family members to know about. Now, some of our ideas offered education for your pastor uh, by bringing recent and authoritative materials to him. And I know that everyone has much to learn in this area. I do eco-theology, but even myself, I found some really neat 
uh, groups that are working in the U.S. that I had no idea about. So the U.S. Catholic priests on climate change was one group that I wasn't familiar with, but also the Catholic action team of the Citizens Climate Lobby. I knew about the lobby, but the Catholic action team was a wonderful new uh, group to connect with. So there are many groups that you can connect with. And again, we give you as many of the links as possible. And another idea that came over and over was to support by connecting with other ministries. Maybe it's with your senior ministries because grandparents are quite a force to be reckoned with when the health and vitality of their grandchildren are at stake. But also, as you heard, don't forget about the youth and young adult ministries. They're very passionate. But we want to share with you a very unique story, uh, a very meaningful partnerships that we, we thought could inspire you. Hello, I'm Julian Brown from St. Francis of Assisi in Bolingbroke. Our Care for Creation team is known as the Laudato Si Ministry of St. Francis of Assisi. I am a Laudato Si animator. And I also recruited a colleague of mine to also become a Laudato Si animator. In doing so, I promised that I would help him with his project to become an animator. That call came and I said, okay, what's your project? And he responded, you. And my response was, really? But first of all, let me thank Grand Knight Joseph Freeman for his vision, because I am willing to bet that we are the only Knights of Columbus Council at St. Francis of Assisi in Bolingbroke to have a position of Laudato Si Ambassador. And you may ask, well, who's the ambassador? Yeah, you guessed it, that's me. But once again, this is a great example of how collaboration between ministries, whether it's at the diocese level or at the parish level, can move forward the teachings of the Dato C. And once again, I want to say thank you for the vision, Grand Night Joe. So another barrier that came up with doing creation care work was finances. Often there's limited budgets and even with COVID, the, the belts have tightened, but it's important to find ways to do creation care despite the lack of finances. So again, we've listed for you several ideas about advocacy and prayer, which is free. But we've also added ideas, more complicated ideas, about developing a green revolving fund in your diocese so that affluent parishes with the resources to benefit from solar power and green initiatives can help other less affluent parishes do the same. So now I'd like you to listen to some great success stories to spark your imagination as you look through our sticky notes. So Father Emmett, will you share with us your success story? Oh, Father Emmett, are you with us right now? Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. I was talking about one of our parishes, St. Thomas More in Oceanside, California. And they've been going steadily for about four or five years. They've changed leadership three times. Each one is more passionate than the last one. Right during COVID, they just kept right on. Recycling, using their money because they had no budget to build a, a huge community garden. And now they're bringing the youth in to do the grunt work. Another of our parishes. Our mother of confidence perfected a plan, a program rather, to get rid of all their plastics and styrofoams by using biodegradable compostable materials. If you go online and type in eco-friendly uh, products, you'll find that they are no more costly than the plastics and styrofoams if they're bought in quantity. They got the Knights of Columbus to buy them in quantity and they asked every event in the parish to use their, uh, uh, these products. We thought it was such a great program. We took it to the, our pastoral diocesan center and uh, it was implemented there. Then we asked the heads of the five departments, pastoral departments to speak on a video 
promoting with their clientele or with their contacts. So that's a couple of examples of how CCTs were very successful here in San Diego. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Father Emmett. And notice again, we have some live links. Meatless Mondays is a way, an inexpensive way of doing creation care. But right now I invite Fran, can you tell us a little bit about creation-centered liturgies and prayers as a way of doing creation care on a limited budget? Sure, uh, my name is Fran Ludwig. I'm from Sacred Heart Parish in Lexington, Massachusetts. Uh, I also lead the uh, Boston Catholic Climate Movement, which is a chapter of GCCM, and I'm an animator like Julian. So praying is one of the things that we do best in our parish, and it's free, of course. <laughs> Organizing community prayer around Earth Day, Legato Sea Week, the season of creation, these are all areas where we can do an environmental theme, and it works for us. So uh, on September 1st, the World Day of Care for Creation, which was declared by Pope Francis, uh, I happened to be in Maine on vacation. So I organized an interfaith service at our beautiful outdoor chapel in the Pines, which you see in the lower left. Um, if we go up to the next slide, Catherine, um, when I got home to Lexington, Mass., uh, we organized uh, what, what one of our former pastors called a green mass. And again, this is uh, how you can engage your pastor. Tell, tell your pastor, we will do all the work for this. Well, most of it. Um, so we uh, offered him suggestions for the music, suggestions for um, prayers of the faithful. And then we said, there's a wonderful resource from the Covenant called Homily Helps under the Resources tab. And lo and behold, sometimes he uses uh, some of the material word for word. Um, so make it easy for your pastor to go this way. Another thing we did was engage our first grade kids in the religious ed program uh, to be part of our procession and they loved it. We asked them to bring their favorite stuffed animal. And I'm not sure what that yellow fuzzy thing is, but I'm sure it's one of God's creatures. <laughs> um, the other thing about engaging kids is that they bring their parents. Another really good talking point for your pastor because we all want people to come back to church. The next slide. Uh, we, one of our most popular prayer services because you can't always match some of the uh, Sunday readings with something that relates to Laudato Si. This one is right up front. Uh, our wonderful blessing of the animals around October 4th, the Feast of St. Francis, is always very popular and it sometimes brings out people that we don't normally see in our Care for Creation team. So uh, enjoyed by all, including the dogs who got lots of dog biscuits from the pastor. <laughs> and also we have an informal uh, prayer walk, which was very successful. And we knew that the creator was smiling on us on our St. Francis Day walk because we were joined by a praying mantis, as you can see in the photo. So all of these prayer experiences help make prayer for creation part of our parish culture. And I should mention that after mass, we also invited people to come over to sign letters to the state legislators uh, about a bill that was related to environmental justice. So we really provide actions as well as prayers. Thank you. Wonderful, and that's a beautiful segue to find out what is happening again at St. Elizabeth Seton. The vision of Laudato Si inspired me to step up creation care activities at our parish. In one weekend, our parish generated over 500 letters to Congress to support specific legislation called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And I can tell you that those letters made a significant impression on our congressional representatives when we hand delivered them. I remain encouraged that 70 million US Catholics can be a powerful force for positive change and that creation care teams are an important vehicle 
to help that change happen. Thank you very much. And I invite Kayla, tell us about this innovative program right beside the graphic with the books. Yeah, hi, it's Kayla again. Um, and so I'm highlighting a program at one of our parishes in the Diocese of Joliet in Naperville, Illinois, also named St. Elizabeth Seton, but a different parish. Um, and most of our care for creation teams do not have a budget. Um, they don't get any finances from the parish. A lot of them use their own finances or have creative ways to make money. Um, so this parish specifically, one of their most successful events every year is um, a resale, like a book resale event. And so they take used books, which is obviously great for the environment instead of throwing these books out. Um, and yeah, it's a book sale. And with all of the funds that they get from the used book sale, um, they use that money for their committee, but also to help the parish in various ways. Like they contributed to become more sustainable. So they contributed uh, to the parish for changing their light bulbs to be more sustainable. They helped uh, install um, hand dryers in the bathrooms at the parishes as well. Um, so it's just a great way to generate funds for their group, but then also share that and impact the parish as a whole. Wonderful, thank you. So I invite you to check out all these links Catholic Energies, the SEEK project, on your own time to see if there's anything that you can incorporate to both uh, be able to do creation care work um, and maybe finance some other projects. Now, in conversation with creation care teams, we also found out that they ask for support specifically in cultivating strong partnerships with families as well as Catholic schools. We know that there is a session about Catholic schools this, this, in this conference, but we wanted to share some of our best practices. So you can see from the slide that collecting, connecting with families really does mean having family-friendly events. It also involves gathering their input, but also being constantly visible. So we wanted to show you via some pictures uh, how people are using their narthex to do creation care. So just look at what was done at St. John the Evangelist Parish. They had a creation care fair in 2019. And what I really love, uh, Paul, you told me about this one, I love the picture, is that you had kind of like a giving treat in the narthex and you invited the whole parish to commit to creation care actions and visualize them. Another way another parish has um, used their narthex for creation care is St. Francis of Assisi Parish. And thank you, Julian, for sending me this picture. This creativity fills the narthex with interesting and yet very practical ways to make a difference on our planet. I love the cow with the meatless Mondays. Um, but I'd also like you to take a look at what is happening at St. Dennis Parish. Hi. I'm Steve Coleman with St. Dennis Care of Creation Team in Madison, Wisconsin. Sometimes if you're doing a large project, you need to be patient. Our solar project took us a year of planning and educating to get the project rolling, secure grants and raise donations. The solar project was visible and attracted attention. And we had an unexpected benefit. The Care of Creation team membership doubled. People saw it, they understood it, they liked it. Visibility can create momentum. I hope this gives you some ideas. Thank you. And now I would love Father Emmett if you could tell us a little bit what is happening to involve parishioners, and especially the young adults in your diocese. Yes, we have a great professional uh, core team, but we're all adults or senior citizens, and we realized we were missing completely young adults. So we came up with the idea of hiring an intern. 
We found a great uh, candidate, a junior, studying sustainability, very Catholic, and had a lot of experience with uh, volunteering. But we had to come up with some money. Well, we found half of it, but we had to get our bishop to, to approve it. So when we brought it up to him, he looked at us, he listened to us, and he just said, do it. I'll give you the other half that you need. So we then went up to our youth and young adult office to talk to them about a campaign we hope will be massive in our 97 parishes of tree planting during September. We have a great uh, Franciscan brother who's a doctor in uh, restorative uh, ecology working with us to help us get the trees. But the youth offices were very positive and they contributed a lot of good ideas. So we're hoping that uh, our young adult uh, intern will be able to network uh, with a lot of people that I'm getting in touch with here and across the nation and especially across our diocese. Thank you. Wonderful. And another area that our creation care teams talked specifically about was connecting with young people, but also with Catholic schools. So I would love for you to hear um, a message from a rising senior, Julia. As a young woman born and raised in Houston, Texas, there has never been a time that climate change hasn't impacted my life. I've grown up driving past the oil refineries and watching as the emissions rise from the smokestacks and pollute the air that I breathe. I have vivid memories of jumping over the cracks in the ground during the drought of 2011 and wondering why my garden was dead. My teenage years have been characterized by flood after flood after flood. And every time I've watched as the floodwaters collected in the streets, rose up my driveway, and filled my school and my friends and neighbors' homes. Winter Storm Uri this past spring was a powerful reminder of how horrific and devastating climate change can be. Much of the narrative around the climate crisis emphasizes that if we want a livable future on this planet, we must act now in order to preserve the resources and infrastructure that we need as humans. My experiences and the experiences of millions of people just like me prove that it's not just our future at stake, it is our present, it is today, tomorrow, even yesterday. We do not need to look to the future to see the effects of climate change, it is here and now. I think it's important to recognize both the urgency of this issue that will impact every single part of our lives if it hasn't already, but also focus on the hope. We have a small window of time in which we can make a change, in which we can alter the path that we're currently on. We don't need to solve climate change. We already have all of the solutions. Now, it is our choice whether or not we take this opportunity, whether we come together as humanity, and whether we truly care for this common home that we've been given. And I'd also like to offer you another young adult who's working um, to do some very innovative things with Catholic schools. Hello everyone, my name is Tulan Pham and I'm an intern for the Care for Creation team down at St. Joseph's in Norman, Oklahoma. And um, we wanted to create an event where people could participate from their homes. And what we decided on was an art competition where people could submit pieces of art, whether that be paintings or photography or um, dances even, that showcased Laudato Si and caring for creation. We actually ended up with 43 entries, which was really amazing. And we were able to do this with, um, within a three month time span from February to May when we judged the art competition. And um, we extended the competition to the whole city of Norman, but also to the whole Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, which is why we were able to reach a good amount of people and get 43 entries. Um, we also had prizes for all three categories of our competition the youth the teen and the adult and it was such a great success not just because of those things but overall because we were able to have conversations with people about caring for creation and the environment and Laudato Si um, in general and 
because of that, I would say that it was a really great success. And um, I suggest anybody who needs an idea to interact with the community but can't do it physically yet, this is a great one. And you get to see how people think of the environment and how people communicate their experiences of the environment and their hope for the future within the art as well. So that was really amazing. And um, I would definitely do it again. <laughs> So another area our creation care teams asked for support in was in resolving conflict. So dealing with political silos, perhaps division or conflict in their midst. Others also thought that a desire for a strong economy meant it was always at odds with creation care. So we tried to assemble some resources for you to use to move this holy work forward and untangle myth from truth. Remember, you'll receive all of these PDFs. So I invite you to kind of read through as I move them too quickly, move through them and kind of pray and reflect over which would really help form you to have fruitful conversations that overcome some of the silos and some of the conflict. Um, also, I would love to highlight what is happening um, in one of the parishes that Kayla works with, because often creation care can be a bridge that connects two distinct divisions, whether it's political divides or economic divides. So Kayla, can you tell us a little bit what is happening at one of the parishes in your diocese? Yeah, so this parish actually is not in our diocese. I met them oh. as we were, pre were preparing for this presentation and we uh, had many conversations with Care for Creation teams all over the country. Uh, so there's a Care for Creation team that has two solid leaders. And when I met with them, they shared that um, one of them is a self-described Republican and the other is a self-described Democrat. Um, so they have different political views, but uh, they're introduced to each other by their pastor because the pastor knew that both of them cared a lot about caring for creation. Um, so when they met, they really hit it off, became good friends and co-lead their care for creation team um, with you know, like the common thread of them being Catholic first, um, it, which has made their Care for Creation team extremely successful and has greatly impacted their whole parish community uh, because they have taken that parish to a very next level when it comes to sustainability and has saved the parish thousands of dollars every year because of the work that they've done to make it more sustainable. Um, and they're able to gain inspiration from various popes in the past and presently, um, and we're able to look over their political divides and work together on caring for creation. Wonderful, so it is possible. We love giving you stories of what is possible. Um, and hopefully there will be some materials in here that you could use to move these conversations forward. And another area that people ask for that I gave you a sneak peek of, is scientific misinformation as well. And all of us put our heads together to try and find ways for your parish to have the information that you can use. So again, I just wanna show you that if you click on these links when you get them in the PDF, then you can have access to this material and bring it to your congregation, to your pastor, to your team. Uh, so you can digest this on your own time. And hopefully this will lead your work in creation care. The other area that people asked about is succession. So the passing on of information when people leave, or perhaps you have a small creation care team and you're looking for the, the members to come in and kind of onboarding members. So again, we put our heads together. And what I found was that communication was key. We talked about talking to one another, having fruitful conversations, but also, in this world today, having a good education and advocacy online is also very important. So we put together some resources if you're looking for th this creation kind of presentation was put together on Canvas. 
Uh, SMORE offers free or, an, or very small subscription for newsletters that work very well. Adobe Spark, you can create short videos. Audacity is um, podcasting. And again, you don't have to do it all on your own. As Father Emmett told us, that often you have some young people and some different people in your congregation that can help with this online communication. And what I noticed when I did the research to create the roadmap, and hopefully you've scrolled through all the pages of the roadmap, the last ones about kind of success creation care teams, every link was live. So when you click on it, it goes to somewhere online to see if this ally could help you in your work. What I found was some people are doing amazing work, but it's very hard to find online materials about what they're doing. Perhaps it's a click to an event or a meeting, but think of online communication as your form of advocacy and education and being an ally for other parishes. Something to think about. So you can shout your contribution to the good news of creation care from the rooftops, but also through your uh, computer screens. So now I'd like to pass the torch to Kayla, whose team did some amazing work interviewing successful creation care teams, and she's going to bring you kind of the wisdom that they wanted to share with you. Kayla? Okay, hi everybody. So care for creation teams um, are going to be important now more than ever, given that the Vatican is asking us to implement the seven year action plan. And we know that at the parish level, care for creation teams are probably going to be the leading force when it comes to implementing these plans. So the work we're all doing here today and in the future uh, could have a massive impact on the church's carbon footprint in the next seven years. And so preparing for this presentation, me and a couple others um, met with uh, over a dozen different care for creation teams from all over the country um, who we believe are outstanding, who've done a lot of great work over the years and transforming their parishes. And the objective of that was to kind of get some defining characteristics of really successful care for creation teams so that we could share all of that information with you. So we asked them how they stayed relevant, what type of events do they do, uh, what are some success factors, and then the relationship with the diocese. We asked them a bunch of other stuff as well, but this is kind of what it's boiled down to. So you could go to the next slide. So basically, it kind of falls under six nice little categories. I'm not going to read all of these slides to you because that would take a while. It might be kind of boring. Uh, but these slides will also go out next week with all the other slides. So one uh, big thing um, that we found was important um, was dedicated leadership uh, of the Care for Creation team. So one person, hopefully more than one person, maybe one, like two or three as a team, um, were really dedicated to keeping the team alive. And that makes a big difference. And then another big success factor is at least getting a thumbs up from the pastor. It's great if the pastor gets involved and is more hands on with the committee, but every uh, group we met with at least has approval from the pastor um, and that makes all of the difference. Um, and then the second column here, uh, each of the groups that we talked to were involved in advocacy in one way or another, whether that was a local environmental justice initiative or something on the state level or something on the federal level, but they were making attempts to make a uh, greater change on the larger level in their communities through advocacy. And then of course, education and engagement with the parish is crucial for care for creation teams and educating our fellow parishioners about the importance of caring for creation. One of the biggest uh, six successes, I would say, that most of the parishes shared with us is that they met their parishioner, parishioners where they were at. So that's specifically at Sunday Mass. So they would have um, presentations in the narthex and uh, like tabling and stuff like that. Okay, you could go to the next slide. Go to the next one. 
Sweet, thank you. Of course, communication is always important in everything we do. So our successful care for creation teams that we talked to were in their parish bulletins very frequently. Uh, we're able to put some stuff on the parish social media pages or the website. And then they're also in communication with each other very frequently, meeting at least once a month. Uh, another big thing that was really helpful for these care for creation teams was offering something hands on that helped serve people and the poor. So whether that's a community garden that feeds people at the local food pantry or uh, the prayer walks or stream cleanups, those are very popular events that parishes put on because people like feeling like they are doing something practical. And then last but not least, they are all also engaged in some form of sustainability project at their parish, whether that was recycling and composting or getting solar panels for the parish. Um, and that is how I, a big way that they are visible at their parish shows that they're having an actual impact, helping the parish save money in the long run and changing the culture of the way that the parish functions. Uh, you could go to the next slide. And then all of the groups that we met with also um, have some form of relationship with their diocese, or at least their diocese is aware of their existence. Um, some of them have uh, more success, like their diocese might have like a Laudato Si committee, like our diocese does, or a justice and peace coordinator who's helpful. Others merely at least get an approval from the diocese or know that they could be a contact for the diocese if other parishes are interested in starting something that they are doing. So a relationship with the diocese is important uh, for a successful care for creation team as well. And that is it for our slides. Wonderful. So now we are moving and pause if you have instructions about the question and answer. Um, I believe they go in the question and answer box. I feel that we do have some questions already. Yes, we do. I'm going to stop sharing. And so I apologize. I am unable to get my video back on. So I'm out in outer space here. Uh, but I am here. Uh, that's important. Um, one, one of the first things I want to put out here is, Catherine, could you repeat, please, where they can find the roadmap at the moment and the fact that they will be getting it as well next week? So there's two things. You have a roadmap right now in your hands. Where do they find that? Excellent question. So for one moment, um, I am going to share my screen again. Sorry, I'm just going to uh, do that. Um, there is a little QR code at the bottom. I know I've said the QR code a few times, but um, the link is actually on the Creation Care website. So if you know of the Creation Care website it is under resource library, but if you wanna be adventurous, then you take your phone and you put the camera on so you, you do the camera, you point it at the screen, and then magically your phone will actually pull up catholicclimatecovenant.org. Um, and I believe that's where the roadmap is. Yes. And it was also included as a link in their registration materials uh, yes. with the information for this um, webinar. So they can found there. And next week, sometime, we are sending to all folks that registered the recording, this uh, resource, slides, everything will be going out. This will live on the Catholic Climate Covenant website. So if they have any issue opening it up, they can send me an email and I can connect them with it. Catherine, there was a question that kept coming up both in the chat and in the Q&A, and it has, comes to you. Do you have a media presence? Do I, as a St. Matthew's Parish group, have a, uh, is it about the creation care team? It said Dr. Wright. Dr. Wright, yes, I do. Um, so actually, if you go to the Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, ecotheologian.com, 
you can actually go on and get creation care team support material, all my blogs. Um, I do experiential learning that um, in systematic theology and some the theology courses. And I believe in public scholarship. So a lot of my materials, my lectures, um, I did one for uh, Catholic social teachings um, and creation care. All of those are available on my website, uh, therightecotheologian.com. And um, yes, I can share it in the chat if you like. And I posted the roadmap so you at least know what you're looking for. So the first page has that map, but here are, these are all the links that are live, all of them. And I am so grateful this team sent me material after material after material. And these are all the materials that they love that work for them. And so this is an incredible resource. And I just wanna say kudos to this entire team because without all of your input, I could never have found all of these wonderful materials. So uh, I just wanna give a shout out to the whole team. Uh, you guys are phenomenal creation care animators. Yes, I second and third that. The next question has to do, I think it's for the full team, and I'm going to sort of put it out there. Um, th there were a lot of these types of questions, the one that seemed to encapsulate what many others were saying. Uh, what is the best framing of the creation care issue for those who oppose parishes getting involved as political? I think uh, if anybody listened to the opening plenary, you heard uh, Cardinal Supich say, yes, it is political. It is a moral question. There are some things that are moral questions that have a political context, but that we shouldn't be you know, shy about dealing with them. How do you in your creation care team uh, efforts, how do you respond to that sort of question. And I'm going to kind of go out there and go first to Roger, because Roger's in Houston, Texas. And if there is a place where it might be political, it might be in Houston. Uh, thank you, Paz, I think. Um, no, it's, it's uh, I, I give a number of presentations and most of the people, most of the parishes and groups that I give presentation, presentations to are very conservative. Um, and, and I think it came up earlier, it, it's knowing your audience is the first main thing. But second, uh, typically, I would say in general, the kind of the redder the parish, the more they're, they're not enamored with, with uh, Pope Francis. So that means that when you present slides, there's a, there's a wealth of material. The Catholic Church has a, just a great history going back to uh, Pope Paul VI with a number of statements and uh, about the Catholics concerned about the environment and even going back to, you know, Genesis and everything else. So um, it, you, you can tailor your message to the audience to make sure that because the, the, the more on the right that they are, that they tend to really, they're more, enam <clears throat> excuse me, more enamored with um, uh, Pope Benedict and JP two, but they've also put out a tremendous amount of information and quotes that you can use and just to get the message across that um, uh, it's, it's not political. The, the, the history of the church will tell you it's not political. Um, so that would be my answer to that. Yeah, to, to support uh, Roger, I, I just put a, a link in the, the chat from the USCCB website, the, uh, you know, the one of seven Catholic social teachings, uh, care for creation. And th that's always a safe reference to, to lead off with that, uh, you know, this is supported by the USCCB. I just want to, in North Carolina, actually, um, it is very, very hard to do creation care. We have one of the biggest parishes and it's very, very hard uh, to, to get through some of the barriers. However, we have networked with different people. And, and I want to second what Roger said, knowing who you're speaking to, and that's why we gave you a plethora of information so that you can 
have fruitful conversations when you know the fears and the ideas and some of the history of who's with you. Um, but one of the things I did do and pause, you, you can, um, I know it's on your resources as well. I gave a history of Catholic social teaching um, and kind of an overview of justice. And I mean, it goes way back and I did a kind of a, um, you know, kind of a creative dialogue and barometer of how creation care team or how creation care became much more um, visible or heard um, up to Pope Francis, because it's not a new thing. Um, I also did that with the universities as well, how it became more and more with universities, but specifically with the Catholic Church. So that might be a resource that is, um, and it's in the resources with climate, Catholic Climate Covenant. It was the first um, talk given um, with Yes, giving the it's the environmental justice webinar uh, number one, part one. Yes, so, so we go back before Benedict. January. It, it gives you that really solid foundation to have those fruitful conversations um, in the present. And if Thank I could you. just I mention one other thing real quick, a couple of things that Phil had uh, were, were excellent. You know, the economics of the climate change, doing nothing, watching, watching the, uh, the disasters increase in number and in cost. Cost is important to just about anybody, but particularly those that, you know, uh, on the right. And if you have grandchildren, let me tell you, that is a great way to connect with other people with grandchildren. If, they, if there's nothing else, you, you have to be concerned about their future. Definitely. Uh, anybody want to talk about the, how would you define success for a CCT? How would you measure it? Anybody can say that they could say, oh, we succeeded. What would have been it? Uh, I mean, I can give you a little bit that it depends on what you, where you are, what your goal is. If it's to save the world next year, I don't think any of us will ever be able to say we succeeded. If it is to move the needle, if it is to get folks motivated and to get folks sort of, ah, getting that aha moment, there are a lot of moments for those successes. Anybody want to deal with that one? I'm going to stay away from succeeded and say succeeding. Succeeding. Yeah. It's not an end. Notice the paths don't stop on the roadmap. Um, there are some targets in science we have to hit. We have to, or we don't have a healthy planet, period. Um, but I think succeeding is better than we're going to make it and then rest on our laurels. Yeah. And I want to sort of second that. The roadmap has if you fit, get this obstacle in front of you, there are other things you can do. Don't just sort of go what I sometimes hear, well, the USCCB isn't uh, giving us any support or my bishop isn't. Find other allies, find your people as the young woman said um, and go and do things with them. Find your success somewhere else if needed. Uh, I did get also a lot of questions about um, the links and everything. I'm going to repeat it. All of the recording, the resource, the slides, as many as we can get, will be sent to you sometime next week. So hold tight with that. If you have a question, um, you can't get me tomorrow or Monday. I'm taking vacation. Uh, but after that, you can email me, pause at Catholic Climate Covenant, and I will connect you with any one of these folks, most of which are uh, found on the creation care team map on the website. If you go to CCTs, go down, there's a map, you will probably be able to find most of these folks. I am looking at the time, I got about another minute. Anybody in the team have something to say and to add? Um, you know, the only other thing is a lot of folks asking about the chat. I will try. I'd be able to save it. Uh, the issue is going to be how to put it in a format that is very readable, because if you know how these things get saved, they are a little funky. But I will try to get you the chat. Uh, anybody oh. on the team have anything else to share? Yeah, I want to make one comment <clears throat> that actually goes back to this question about the political silos and all the people who don't want to play ball. <clears throat> it's really important to get 
detractors into a one-on-one -on -one conversation so that all the posturing goes away. And then start a conversation about what really matters to you. Because for just about everyone, what really matters are the same things, economic security, safety for your family, future for your children and so forth. And that puts the conversation at kind of a, a level playing field, if you will, that we're agreeing that we want the same things. And then you can begin talking about, well, what's stopping us from getting there? Realize that we actually have the same goals, even if we might think they're major, you know, different approaches. So get into that one-on-one -on -one conversation, find out what really matters. Thank you, Phil. That was a great way to sort of ease us into the end of the webinar. Thank you, all of you. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you for being on this working group. I hope you will say yes if I call again. Um, I'm wondering if many of you might say, oh no, pause is calling, I'm not answering. I, I hope that's not the case. Uh, so I think at this point, we are moving into our closing prayer. Okay. Hi. Yes. Just, I will share my screen just one moment. Sorry, I was, I was excited about the chat um, and I was reading so many wonderful comments. So bear with me. So, hi, uh, my name is Paul Litwin. I'm uh, here from Seattle, Washington and I'm gonna lead the closing prayer. Uh, the indigenous peoples of North America honor an ancient ritual of praying while facing in different directions. With them, let us unite in prayer facing each of the directions as indicated. So uh, from your, your homes, you can either face the direction, you know, going this way or that way, or you can just use your arm to face in one direction or the other, or you can just stay still. It doesn't matter. The um, refrain for everyone will be, we are grateful for these gifts, oh God. Now we won't hear all your voices, but I would still encourage you to say the refrain. So I'm gonna start by facing east. From the east come peace and light and wisdom and knowledge. We are grateful for these gifts, O oh God. Facing south, from the south come warmth and guidance and the beginning and the end of life. We are grateful for these gifts, O oh God. Facing the west, from the west comes the rain, purifying water, to sustain all living things. We are grateful for these gifts, O oh God. From the north come the cold and mighty wind and the white snows, giving us strength and endurance. We are grateful for these gifts, O oh God. May we walk good paths, blessed God, living on this earth as brothers and sisters should, rejoicing in one another's blessing, empathizing in one another's sorrows, and together with you in the name of Jesus and with the Spirit's awakening breath, renewing the face of the earth. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, Kathy, could you please hit end webinar? Uh, Kathy Kwasniewski. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Kathy, you can hit uh, end webinar at the bottom, little red button. Kathy.